My apologies, it's very important always to be switched on. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome all of you to Holy Trinity this morning, uh, and a great w uh, welcome to Bishop Rowan Williams. We're very grateful indeed that he was able to come and preach, uh, having given uh, a talk yesterday in the Literary Festival, with which so many people here are connected, of course. And uh, we look forward also to having a chance briefly to have a coffee after the service before the parish meeting which follows. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may worship in the newness of life, the glory of your name. Amen. Mighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. <coughs> o 
God, for as much as without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson is taken from Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 to 14. When the people of Israel saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to him, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them and formed it in a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. <coughs> when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They arose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up over the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I, I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these, this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let, me know, now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and if I were and I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why your wrath burn against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why, why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your face from wrath, Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember I, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. For the word of the Lord. Be God. <clears throat> New Testament lesson is taken from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Oedia and Sintet to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving that your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing these things that you have learned and received and heard from and seen in me. The God of peace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory Once more Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the elders of the people in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, 
How did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Just at the moment, we seem to be having a series of very difficult gospel readings. All the most challenging parables of Jesus seem to be stacked up for this season. Perhaps not inappropriate for so challenging and tragic a moment in our world's history. But what is going on in the story that Jesus tells in this morning's gospel? It's the story, you might say, of, of an aborted act of reconciliation. The king's son is to be married. Marriage, a sign of unity, a sign of concord and of fertility. If it's a king's son, he's probably marrying another king's daughter. And perhaps two kingdoms are being reconciled in that moment. Throughout the history of both Jewish and Christian interpretation, marriage has been seen as a sign of the reunion of heaven and earth. This is not just any old wedding reception. This is the reconciling moment of the kingdom. Because Jesus is talking about the kingdom, talking about that world where God's will, God's vision, God's purpose shapes everything that we are. So the story begins with an invitation to celebrating peace, to celebrating reconciliation. And what's being refused in the story by those who won't or can't see is the possibility of peace. And part of the force and weight of the parable, which certainly should disturb us very deeply, is that to refuse peace is to refuse life. If we refuse reconciliation, we refuse to place ourselves where we can receive life, love, and promise from others. So it's not entirely surprising if those who say no to this invitation come to a very bad end indeed in this parable. And what about that bewildering footnote about the guest who wanders in without a wedding garment? the unfortunate chap who turns up without a black tie? Well, what he is without is a wedding garment. He has come casually, unprepared for reconciliation, unready to make peace. He simply drifted in for a free meal, one assumes. And although there are plenty of people who have been corralled in for a free meal, this is somebody who seems to be unaware of what that free meal celebrates. He hasn't got a wedding garment. He's not clothed with the hope of peace. And so he too ends up on the wrong side of this particularly bad-tempered monarch who is the hero of the story. Quite a lot there to make us pray and think examine ourselves and our world. Saying no to the promise and possibility of reconciliation is a death sentence for ourselves. Our selfish, self-oriented, short-termist and other ignoring selves. It's a frightening story 
and it's meant to be. It echoes words that Jesus speaks on so many other occasions in the Gospels, where he says, in effect, to those around him, especially to the leaders of the people and the political establishment, he says, you do not know what it is you're refusing. You're saying no to life. You're saying no to your own future. And that, surely, is the tragedy that we are looking at and praying so earnestly into at the moment as we look around at the Middle East, where we see communities destroyed in the most hideous and appalling way because they cannot see that their peace and their life lie with one another. The terrible attack last weekend by Hamas on innocent Israelis, the massive retaliation that has this week killed so many more in Gaza. Without going into the politics, the blame game, the one thing we can say with certainty is that these are communities, or rather these are political blocks, looking at one another with an absolute refusal to see that reconciliation is possible and that they might find life with one another. And anyone looking from a distance, as we do, is bound, I think, to be saying, why is it they cannot see that neither can be safe unless the other is safe? Neither can live unless the other lives. We look at it from a distance, and then perhaps we bring it a little bit clear, nearer home, into our own society, into all those patterns of rivalry and injustice and unease that pervade our society, where once again it doesn't seem to have got through that reconciliation is what we need for our life, that no one can live without the life of their neighbor. And then it starts getting really uncomfortable when we look at our own relationships, our own tangles and problems, our own individual challenges for peacemaking with one another, with those we find difficult. It's a continuum from those small rivalries and stresses that we're so familiar with to the terrible patterns of slaughter and injustice that prevail elsewhere in the world. Just at the moment, our eyes are on the Middle East, but they might equally be on so many other places, on Ukraine, the Democratic Republic of Congo or South Sudan, Yemen, Azerbaijan, and so it goes on. Place after place, community after community, where in one way or another people are saying, I can only live if you die. And to this, the gospel says what it has always said, I can only live if you live. Jesus says to his disciples at another point, because I live, you will live also. And that's not just a pious remark made by a Jewish teacher 2,000 years ago. It is what Jesus says to us today and what we must learn from him to say to one another. Because I live, you will live also. Because you live, I will live also. And our challenge is how we build a society, a world, a pattern of relationships in which we are life givers to one another, not death dealers. Two last things to think about. One is to go back to our first lesson, that great dramatic story about the golden calf. And those of you who've read on a little bit further in the story will remember the comical moment where Aaron attempts to explain himself to Moses. Quite a task. You can imagine Moses coming down the mountain looking at piles of drunken Hebrews lying around after a bad night of revelry and idolatry and saying to Aaron, anything you'd like to tell me? 
And Aaron unforgettably says, well, um, all these people gave me their jewelry and I put it in a big pot and melted it down and, and out came this calf. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew that small acts of idolatry, small acts of possessiveness, small acts, earring small acts of unfriendliness and refusal could somehow pile up into this enormous, monstrous golden calf, this symbol standing between the people and God. That, sadly, is how it works. The tiny little things, the earring-sized sins and possessivenesses that we are so indulgent to, turn up the temperature a bit, and out comes this calf. Out comes this massive, idolatrous picture of who we are and what matters to us, which turns out to be, in the story about Moses, a death-dealing moment. But lest we end on too negative a note, Paul in Philippians gives the necessary alternative perspective. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I tell you, be glad. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is here. All of this should only worry us and drive us to prayer and penitence because of the joy that is set before us. Be glad in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Be glad because the Lord is here. Because the marriage of heaven and earth has happened, is happening, will happen in the reality of Jesus Christ. Because that marriage of heaven and earth is celebrated here at the king's wedding feast, which is Holy Communion. Because the doors are wide open. Because there is nothing more God can give us or do for us, having done everything. Rejoice in the Lord. Sometimes it's only by seeing what is involved, the loss that's involved in saying no to life and joy and peace. Only in seeing the cost of that that we begin to understand the glory of the reconciliation that is given, that is already there. The wedding garment already provided for us, free of charge. The joy of the king's invitation. The joy of a humanity restored in peace and life together joy of that open door between earth and heaven here at the Holy Eucharist. We are invited. It is that easy to step into life and away from death. And if we as the body of Christ, we as the community of believers, can't do this visibly, gladly, decisively, mercifully, what does that look like to the world that has yet to see the open door and yet to glimpse the glory of reconciliation? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. stand to affirm our faith in that same God and that same life to which we are all called. We believe in one God.
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being from the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. Come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Ghost, the giver of life, and proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. At the start of this week, we come to you, O God bringing our hurts for your healing, our concerns for your care, our labours as our offerings, and our lives as our worship. We come to you through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who became like us so that we may become like him. At the start of this week, we come to you, O God, Help us to look for your kingdom and the age to come, when the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Strengthen Helen Ann, Bishop of Newcastle, Mark, Bishop of Berwick, and all our church, especially at this time those leading our worship and directing our thoughts during our vacancy and those working towards appointing a new incumbent. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At the start of this week, we come to you, O God. Help us to love one another. Let the light of your justice search out the darkness of our world. Let all people live in freedom and peace. Bless and guide Charles our King, give wisdom to all in authority, and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At the start of this week, we come to you, O God, with peace in our hearts, to pray for a world struggling to find peace. We pray for families separated and people exiled from the land of their birth by frontiers, by barbed wire, by divisions in the minds of men and women. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for all areas of conflict. And especially we pray for all those suffering from violence in the occupied Palestinian territory and in Israel. And we pray for the Christians caught up in that conflict. Wherever fear, hatred and terror rule, strengthen those who work towards eliminating evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At the start of this week, we come to you, O God. In your hands you hold the souls of the righteous And in your heart there is room for all people. Shine on all those who are suffering. 
for those whom we are asked to pray today, for Gerald Sandworth, Tessa Salby, Joshua Seymour, Anne Bradley and family, Geraldine Roberts, Margaret Bush, Evelyn Swanston, Samuel Adair, Robert Tobin, and Sophie Isaac, and in our care home, Elma Starrett. And we pray for any uh, in your grace and mercy that we may know, knowing that you are watching over them and us. We pray too for the for those who have recently departed, for Leo Osborne, Paul Nana, Mary Birtwistle, David McCreeth, and for those whose ears mind falls at this time, Rosie Robertson, Heather Morrison, Pamela Dudgeon, Peter Middlemiss, Alistair McNaughton, and Eric Lomax. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At the start of this week, we come to you, O God, from the quietness that surrounds us and your promise of deep peace within us. Dwell with us this week as our welcome guest, that we may know your presence with us in our prayers and in our lives, in our tears and in our joy. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. We stand for the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And let us offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Anne. Thank you very much. Peace be with you. 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 Peace be with you, Dermot.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. Become for us the bread of life. Blessed are, you, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. Become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed, Blessed be God. God. You are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so far, the calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. 
Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of our Blessed Lady and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit will honour and glory be yours Almighty Father for ever and ever. Let us pray with confidence to the Father in the words our Saviour gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We are one body, because we all share. holy gift for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. In the glory of God the
Let us pray. Holy and blessed God, you have fed us with the body and blood of your Son and filled us with your Holy Spirit. May we honour you not only with our lips, but in lives dedicated to the service of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. few notices. First of all, I think on behalf of us, we should thank Bishop Rowan for a stimulating and wonderful sermon. And thank you for giving up your time when I know you have a very, very busy schedule. As was said, the open meeting this morning is um, as soon as we can for finished coffee. And then if you haven't had a chance to come in this morning or you're doing something else, it will be repeated seven o'clock in the parish centre on Tuesday. We've put out the arms box at the back of church for donations to Christian Aid, who are appealing for funds for their work in the Middle East. Please, no more blister packs at the moment as we've nowhere to recycle them and Anne's garage is getting rather full. Please join us if you can and between um, uh, events at the Literary Festival, we have tea, cake, and um, chat, if you wish, this afternoon in the Parish Centre from 2.30 till 4. The last of this summer's organ recitals is on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Daniel Cook, the organist and choirmaster for Durham Cathedral, is playing. Please come. All the recitals we have had this year have been a real treat. The Harvest Supper is next Saturday, the 21st, 6.30, in the Parish Centre, 
If you haven't done so, please sign up um, at the uh, end of the service this morning. We will take the um, sign up thing into, the, uh, into coffee. We need numbers um, by Tuesday. There are also some leaflets at the back, I hope, um, and if not, you may have them, about the Middlemas conversation, which is on Wednesday the 25th of October at seven o'clock in Lady Waterford Hall. This is the annual deanery lecture in memory of Peter Middlemas, who amongst many other things was church warden here, in fact, over the time of our last interregnum. So please take a, a leaflet or I'll try and make sure they're at the back. Finally, for this week anyway, next week, uh, next Sunday morning, our bishop, the Bishop of Newcastle, Bishop Helen Ann, is coming to preach. So please come and join us on Sunday morning. And she has said she can stay for a short time to be with us for coffee afterwards so that we can talk to her. Thank you. We stand for God's blessing. The Lord be with you. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thank you, God.